Well, thank you very much for, for coming to this, uh, I think, an exceptional uh, uh, presentation here. The, my uh, name is Prem Paul, and I have the honor of being Vice Chancellor for Research and Economic Development. We very much appreciate you joining this afternoon for a special lecture. I would also like to welcome our guests joining us via our live web stream. It is indeed my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kirk Johnson, SANT Director of the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, and to welcome him to our campus. I first met Kirk about a year ago when a number of our colleagues from, from the museum and, and, and the friends, we made a trip to Washington, D.C., visited uh, Smithsonian, and our goal was really to, to learn about the cutting edge uh, 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 approaches uh, to, to museum exhibits and learn about Smithsonian. And in that particular trip, we uh, met with, with Kirk, and uh, w what, what really impressed me was the, not only that he's a very accomplished scholar, but he knew so much about Nebraska. He knew so much about our museum that his enthusiasm uh, uh, was very impressive and genuine. Uh, and so actually, I developed even more appreciation for our uh, great museum that we have. So Kirk, uh, thank you for your, all that, uh, your, your energy and enthusiasm, and thank you for uh, taking time to, to come and visit us in Nebraska. So as a result of that visit, our University of Nebraska State Museum is now a Smithsonian affiliate museum. And that's the only the third institution in our state to be designated a Smithsonian affiliate, along with the Durham Museum in Omaha and the Strategic Air and Space Museum. And we've already seen uh, many benefits of uh, being affiliated with Smithsonian. And so thank you for your support and thank you for the suggestion. So celebrating its new designation as, as a Smithsonian affiliate, the University of Nebraska State Museum welcomes uh, Dr. Johnson to campus to discuss his appreciation for the paleontolo paleontology of Nebraska and for the unique stories that it tells. Kirk's past research has involved work at hundreds of fossil sites in the American West. While at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, he curated the Prehistoric Journey exhibition and wrote the book, Cruising the Fossil Freeway, an epic tale of a scientist and artist on the ultimate 5,000 mile paleo road trip. Dr. Johnson's research focuses on fossil plants the extinction of the dinosaurs and the methods for dating rocks and fossils. He's known for the scientific books and articles, museum exhibits, presentations, and collaborations with artists. In 2010-11, Johnson led the Snow Mastodon Project, the excavation of an amazing Ice Age site near Snowmass Village, Colorado, featured in the NOAA documentary, Ice Age Death Trap. Kirk has been the SAND Director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History since October 2012, where he's presently supervising the renovation of the nation's fossil halls. Most recently, you may have seen in the paper where Kirk signed for a, specific, a special FedEx delivery last week, the Smithsonian's first T-Rex dinosaur fossil that will be mounted in the new dinosaur hall that will open in 2019. So I ask you to join me in welcoming uh, and giving uh, Kirk a really warm Husker welcome uh, to, 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 to campus. So. Thanks very much. Well, thanks, Prem. It's nice to be here. Hello, everyone. Uh, I got to say that. Uh, I've been looking for an excuse to come to Lincoln for a long time, and this provided me this excuse. I, I love fossils, I love museums, and you have an amazing 
fossil-filled museum in this town. And for, for years, I've been here a couple times, but sort of briefly, and I just spent the last four hours deep in the, the bowels of the museum. And many people don't realize that museums are public exhibit spaces, but they're also places that hold these treasures on behalf of our culture. And the, the public part of a museum is the tip of the iceberg of a museum. And museums have really three functions. It's the public education around science and culture. It's the preservation of these rare treasures on behalf of the public. And it's the creation of new knowledge with the scholars. So it's a very natural fit for a, a university to have a museum. And it's a very natural thing for this university to have this museum because Nebraska is an amazing state. Now, I, I've never lived in Nebraska, but I have two ties th to validate my Nebraska credibility. The, the first is that my grandfather was born in North Loop, Nebraska, and at the age of 10 moved to Fresno, California with his 11 brothers and sisters and their Swedish immigrant parents. And so they were, they, I guess they got tired of the sod house and moved out to grow figs in Fresno, California. The second piece, though, is that um, you, some of you may remember Corn Cob Man, right? <laughs> the predecessor to Little Red. But um, one of the earlier um, stages of uh, mascots for the Huskers, my uncle Leroy was a uh, defensive coach for the Huskers from 1958 to 1961. And the, the key point there is that on October 31st, 1959, his defense and the Huskers stopped the 74-game winning streak from Oklahoma. And, and was one of the great games in Husker history. And in 2009, the 50th anniversary of the game, my, my uncle came here back to, to Nebraska. He's been, he's been coaching at the, um, the Razorbacks in Arkansas for recent years. But so I think those two things, just a little bit of Nebraska cred. And the real thing is that for years, I've been paying attention to the paleontology of Nebraska and have come to the conclusion that Nebraska offers something absolutely unique in the world when it comes to fossils. And I'm doing that thing that you should never do, which is to go somewhere and tell people about themselves. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you about Nebraska for the next hour. <laughs> and I hope to enlighten you on something that, is, that is, should be as, as, as pride-inducing as the 1959 victory over the Oklahoma um, football team. Now, um, I, I presently the director of the world's largest natural history museum in Washington, DC. I've been there for a year and a half. I spent most of my career at Denver as a scientist doing field research in the American West and in fact um, all over the Great Plains. So I'm a, very much a person of the plains and love digging fossils in the plains and traveling the plains and, and the, the spirit of the plains. Moving to Washington DC has been a uh, transition. My museum is uh, vast. We see 7.4 million visitors a year, which means we typically see 35 or 40,000 people a day in the museum which is remarkable in terms of attendance. We have 127 million objects in our collections, including things like the Hope Diamond, and as of last week, a Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton, which is like the Hope Diamond of dinosaurs. <laughs> and uh, we have literally um, over 500 resident scientists and many thousands more that visit and do scientific research. Just last year alone, scientists at the National Museum described 335 new species and did research in 71 countries. So it's a massive, I, it's a, basically the mothership of natural history museums. And one of my um, roles as the director of that museum is to work with regional museums and see how we can um, support the concept of natural history museums nationally. So I think that national muse history museums really are the place where we keep the things that matter about our natural history and our culture. And those museums are to be treasured. So I'm here on behalf of museums in general. And I think Priscilla and her team have done a great job uh, with the museum here. It's a, and as you'll see, I'm going to delve into the history of the University of Nebraska Museum and why I think it is uniquely important in the world's museums and why it's a treasure that um, is to be preserved and cherished. Now, this is how I normally looked in my old job. I, I'm a, what they call a digging paleontologist. I, I lead shovel armies across the landscape and we dig fossils. And that's, that's really my favorite mode of interaction is being out on the landscape and digging and finding fossils. And uh, when you're a paleontologist, you actually have the ability to see back in time. Because you find fossils, you reconstruct ancient landscapes, you populate them with their plants and animals, you build these ancient worlds, and you can literally see them in your own brain. Paleontologists are weird that way. They can see back in time. And uh, you know, so when I look at a coal mine, here's a coal mine in Wyoming. When I look at a coal mine, what I see, I see the coal mine, 
But I also see the swamp that made the coal, that made the coal mine. So I see the landscape that was there before that had to pre-exist to make coal mine. And I found that I was doing this all the time by myself, and it was very frustrating to have all this information put up in my head. So I started collaborating with artists, because when you collaborate with an artist, you can port that information into the artist's brain, and then it comes out the tip of their brush onto the canvas, and they can paint or create those landscapes that the paleontologist sees. And I've done that now in about 70 different examples of prehistoric worlds. And what's quite incredible is that we live on a planet that's ever-changing. It's been around for 4.567 billion years, and there are lots of extinct landscapes. And it turns out that Nebraska has many, many kinds of places over the last 4 billion years. And the story of Nebraska is what I want to tell you today. Uh, here's Jan Vriesen, one of the artists I work with. In this case, we did sort of four 8 by 10 foot paintings of different landscapes in Colorado. Um, here's a painting that was done with uh, Donna Breganitz. This is Denver, Colorado, 70 million years ago. <laughs> 70 million years ago, Nebraska and Colorado were completely submerged beneath a shallow, salty sea. So it's pretty easy to paint that painting, as it turns out. Um, when we did the excavation of the Denver International Airport in 1990, we uncovered huge slabs of stone covered in palm fronds. And it turned out that the airport runway was a 65 million year old palm forest. So we did an exhibit. And if you ever fly through Denver and Concourse B and walk down the concourse on the terrazzo floor, there are fossils in the floor. I, my goal in life is to put fossils where you cannot miss seeing them. So if you've been to Concourse B, you've seen my fossils in your face. Um, and here, of course, is the Colorado Front Range, the edge of the plains, the western edge of the plains, as it looked 16,000 years ago with mammoths and camels on the landscape. So there's this great narrative of the planet of, the Earth, of planet Earth told by the fossil record in various places. And it just happens that Nebraska's got a really sweet story. Now, my friend Ray Troll, an artist I work with a lot now, calls what I do time travel with a shovel. I dig up stuff, I reconstruct the ancient landscapes, I reconstitute them, I pump that back through the scientific filters, and I build the museum dioramas or paintings or TV shows or whatever it is to make accessible the distant story of the planet. And the fact is that Paleontology and geology is pretty complicated, and it's underground often, so you don't see it. So you can be forgiven for not knowing this story, but after this lecture, you cannot be forgiven for not knowing this story. So here's my buddy Ray Troll. He's an Alaska-based artist, but he grew up in Kansas, so he too has a, a feeling for the plains. And um, he's a great artist because I can just whisper something in his ear like, just imagine this amazing fossil, and pretty soon an image will appear. So he's a great, and you know, I could give him an idea, and he just starts to crank along. We did this book called Cruising the Fossil Freeway, where we got in a blue truck and drove 5,000 miles around the um, American West, visiting all the fossil sites and trying to tell the tale these landscapes. Now, now Ray's kind of a punster as well. He's not just, a, he's not simply helping me paint ancient landscapes. He's a joker. He uh, is actually known for his t-shirts. He's sold more than 2 million t-shirts, um, and a lot of them are sort of fishy, jokey, t-shirts. And so when I say something like long necks, I'm referring to the long neck dinosaurs that lived in the Morrison Formation 150 million years ago in Colorado. And he thinks of long necks, right? So, <laughs> or sauropod light, a beer for the ages. <laughs> so we have fun. And I think fun is all part of learning as well, right? It's, 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 you can joke and pun and have a good time. And so off we go on our truck, um, driving along. And a lot of Ray's work has to do with daydreams or dreams of, you know, dreaming about ancient landscapes. And so as you drive across the landscape and we're talking, you'd be like, well, how big would a long neck be? And you can sort of imagine it driving along. And here's the cover of our book where there's the truck, there's me, there's Ray. And you can see that all of the creatures that used to live here now start to populate the book. We start to bring them back to life in a fun way. And of course, they're not all alive now. We get that. But um, there's such amazing things, some of these things that are only recently known. For instance, this animal right here, this crazy ostrich-looking thing with great big claws, it was only named two weeks, uh, three weeks ago. It's called Anzu wileyi, and it's been known for about a decade, but it was just published um, most recently. So what Ray and I like to do is go around and, and peer into museum collections and find these great stories that haven't been told. Discover the animals that are hiding in that part of the museum that's the 99% of the bottom of the iceberg and tell those stories. And in so doing, get people excited about science and paleontology and exploration and getting outside. 
Um, I think it's less of a problem here in Nebraska, but around the rest of the country, people are spending less and less time outside. They just don't go outside anymore. Kids are on iPhones and they're inside. More than half of our population um, lives in cities. I mean, it's a, it's a situation where people are in, in, enjoying the out of doors less than they used to, and um, we want to stop that. So one of the things we did on this road trip was we said we need to build a map. We need to create the map of our trip so that we can use that as a guide. And here's Ray working on the map on the wall of his studio in Kitchikan, Alaska. And here's the map. It's an insanely detailed map. There's 472 individual illustrations of this map. Each one is based on an actual fossil that was found where you see it on the map. And you can see there's Nebraska, and here's Colorado and Wyoming. And uh, we're presently working on the West Coast now. We're working on a series of maps from California all the way up to Alaska. And the, the immediate impression you see on this map is that no matter where you go, there are going to be fossils there. As almost every part of the planet has fossils of some age, and there's some part of the planet's history that's told by the fossils. And uh, as a result, when I'm driving around, I actually pay attention to what's underneath the car and the ground. If you're driving in a car with me, you can say, how old are the rocks beneath the car? And I will say, oh, the rocks beneath the car are about 30 million years old. Oh, we're getting young. Now they're 20 million years old. And if we got out of the car, here's the kind of things we would find, or here's the kind of things we would look for. And this layered sequence of rocks and time, geologically, it's called the geologic column. And you, there are these names you've heard, I'm sure, before, names like Triassic and Jurassic and Cretaceous. These are the stacked layers of increasingly younger rocks with different fossils in them. And here's geologic time. So for the last 4.6 billion years, there's been a planet. For the last half a billion years, there have been all sorts of things going on on the planet. And it turns out that Nebraska has a really particularly sweet story to tell in this time period. Now, Ray, this is not an ex actually a really easy concept for a lot of people, that there's layers of rock beneath your feet. You can see them in places like the Grand Canyon or at Scott's Bluff. You can see the layers exposed. But for most people, they don't think they're all over the place. And in the, in the Great Plains, there are layers everywhere. That's what we drill down into to get groundwater. That's what we drill down into to get oil and gas. That's what we drill down into to get coal. But uh, it's not entirely normal. But I've found, and Ray's a very food-oriented guy, so i found that often just a stack of pancakes helps to explain geology. And if you think about those layered formations as pancakes, then you can have a breakfast and talk about it. So think now of Nebraska as a stack of pancakes. So if you look at the geologic map of Nebraska, we're over on the east side here in Lincoln. Here's western Nebraska. You can basically see some blue stuff. There's some green stuff. And the, this should be yellow. It looks more green on this image. But it's basically blue Nebraska, green Nebraska, and yellow Nebraska. And you thought there was just red and blue Nebraska. <laughs> in fact, there's red, green, and yellow Nebraska. And those are the pancakes. The green pancake is underneath the yellow pancake. The blue one is underneath the green one. So there's a stack of pancakes. The pack stack is tilted that way. So you're driving up through the stack as you drive west. And within this, there are smaller and thinner pancakes. But what you see is that the entire state, the blue is this stuff. It's about 300 million years old. There it's blue. The green is this stuff. It's Cretaceous. It's about 80 million years old. The yellow is up in here. This is between 35 and 0 million years old. So Nebraska, right off the bat, has three different stories it will tell us about the history of life on Earth. And it's right there in the geologic map. And you know it's a great big state, and everywhere you go, there's stuff beneath your feet. So it, for me, it's very painful to drive across Nebraska, because I always want to get out and dig holes. <laughs> and that's what people in this museum have been doing for a long time. Since the 1870s, they've been digging holes and finding magnificent fossils and bringing them back to this museum in this town where they have accumulated literally the best collection of fossil mammals from 35 million years ago to the present anywhere in the world. Right? I just said that this collection is better than any other collection of a similar time period anywhere in the world. So you can't go to Kansas and find a collection like this. In fact, you can't go to Washington, D.C. or New York and find a collection like this. The collection that's in, this, in, in the Nebraska Hall and Morrill Hall is the best collection of fossil mammals in the world for this time period. And it's a thing that I want to talk to you about because I think it's really important you know about it because they're such amazing stories. Now, let's go back to that first when we were in what we called Blue Nebraska. And Blue Nebraska is a time about 300 million years ago. 
It's a time when there was, we were just finishing off with an ice age, and the kind of, it was a, basically a, a broad forested landscape next to a shallow sea. The trees that lived here, these very weird bottle brush trees called lycopods, and they didn't actually um, make a canopy. Their entire tree was photosynthetic, so the, the trunks and the roots were green, and the sunlight went to the bottom of the forest floor. Further to the east in, in Indiana and Illinois, they make the great big coal seams of the, the basins of uh, middle America. And if you went out to sea during this time, there were some very weird little creatures like this guy. This is an Enopterygian shark. And there was a whole fauna of crazy sharks in the seas of Nebraska. Jump forward to green Nebraska. Green Nebraska is when we had the development of a sea that started coming in from the Gulf of Mexico and it connected up with the Arctic Ocean and a sea separated Western North America from Eastern North America. We call Western North America Laramidia, Eastern North America was called Appalachia, and Nebraska was called the bottom of the sea, <laughs> as was Colorado. And here's an image of what it looked like as the sea's prograding. And just the rocks around Lincoln here, that you can find this formation called the, the Dakota Sandstone. And the Dakota Sandstone was the beach of that sea. And very often you'll find um, rusty cobbles in the Dakota Sandstone that have leaf imprints in them. And here's what you see is the forest at the edge of the sea that, and the sea eventually came in and flooded the interior part of the continent. And uh, here are some of these fossil leaves from the Dakota Formation. And one of the very um, important fossils in Colorado is this beautiful Cretaceous flower called the, uh, the Rose Creek flower that's found in, in the rocks that are about 100 million years old. It's one of the first good examples of a fossil flower, and Nebraska can claim, claim to that. Uh, but a, sooner or later, the sea actually covered the place, and in places up to depths of several hundred feet. So you had a, a shallow, salty sea completely covering the state, continuous all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, continuous all the way up to the Arctic Ocean, splitting North America in two, a very different world. And the evidence for that sea is right in our faces. We find it in all sorts of places. We find lots of marine fossils. We find chocks along um, places along the uh, banks of the river over there. There's the chalk cliffs of Nebraska. And those chalky layers are just like the chalk cliffs of Dover. They're the ancient oozy bottom of the seafloor. And we find extraordinary fossils in these uh, marine deposits. This is the lower jaw of a particularly nasty fish called Zephactinus. This fish got up to about 15 to 18 feet in length. And it's a fish that was known to swallow other fish whole. And we have many examples of fossils of this fish with whole fish in its belly. And the fact that they're in his belly when we find him dead suggests that this fish is an advertisement against gluttony. <laughs> um, here is a, um, an animal called the plesiosaur. This is a long-necked marine reptile. And we have a really nice example of one of these in the museum that was collected here in Nebraska. And it turns out that, as I read the literature in Nebraska, Nebraska is quite proud because their plesiosaur, this is the one that's in Denver, this animal, and their plesiosaur here is actually about six inches longer than the one that we collected. <laughs> so yes, your plesiosaur is bigger than my plesiosaur. <laughs> Here's one of those Zephactinus fishes. It's incredible things. And, uh, when Ray looks at something like this, he just cannot contain himself. He just imagines what it would be like <laughs> to get one of these things on a dry fly <laughs> and then play it in. And so here's a Ray image of the animals that lived in the seaway that covered Nebraska about 80 million years ago. And you look at these things and say, this cannot be. These things are all this, these plesiosaurs, there's mosasaurs, there's giant sea turtles, there's sharks. There's gigantic clams, there's ammonites, there's baculites. But in fact, everything you see here is based on a really nice fossil, either in this museum or the other good place to see fossils from this um, seaway is down in Hayes, Kansas. And um, this fish, this fish right here, Penanogmus, is crazy thing. Like, there's no fish like that, but look at this. Here it is. So these things exist. They're underground here in Nebraska. And one thing we know is there haven't been that many paleontologists around, and they haven't been digging fossils for that long, a couple hundred years, only a few of us. Most paleontologists actually sit in their office and type on email right now, it turns out. Um, and so it means that the best fossils are A, still on the ground, 
and be likely to be found by people who aren't paleontologists by road crew people, and Nebraska has this fabulous program where they have a, a paid employee here at the museum who works with the Nebraska Highway Department and salvages fossils off the roadways in Nebraska. And it's quite amazing because the, the, kind of the quality and number of great fossils that have been collected for this museum by that project are amazing. There's a nice exhibit at the museum, but I was just in the collections, and there's, there's really treasures that need to be in museums that have been saved from the Nebraska roadways because of this great partnership, which is celebrated its 50th anniversary recently. So it's pretty incredible that that partnership exists. But also, people who own property in Nebraska, people who are farmers, people who are digging, people who are contractors or excavators, chances are good if you're digging in the dirt in Nebraska, and if you have your eyes open, you'll find fossils. What are you going to do? Call a museum. That's what you do. You call a museum, they'll swoop out there, and they, they're very happy to scoop up more treasures of Nebraska's fossil wealth and bring it back to the museum. Um, so it, there's incredible things that come out of this seaway, and, and they, like I said, they come out on a regular basis. And uh, this year, we're going to be, um, I'm working on a three-hour film with NOVA about the geology of North America, and we'll be out visiting the seaway deposits. And, and we've talked to a lot of people who have those big fish in the ground waiting for us to arrive. So you think that the things in museums have been there forever, is it something that's old that happened a long time ago? Nothing could be further from the truth. These things are happening on a regular basis now and everybody can be part of it. And just keep your eyes open. And when somebody says to you, hey, what's that thing? And you remember this talk and send them to the museum in Lincoln. So the real prize for Nebraska is that most of the state is yellow. This whole western half, western three quarters of Nebraska. These are sedimentary rocks that were deposited between 35 million years ago and the last 10,000 years. So it's the last 35 million years of Earth history. And this is where Nebraska's fossil record is unparalleled in the world. There's no other place on the planet, including South Dakota, Colorado, Kansas, where these rocks are better exposed or have more fossils. And I knew that coming in here, but I just spent four hours this morning and I am fully 100% convinced of the veracity of that statement, having looked at incredible fossils that have been collected by this museum over the last um, 100 plus years. Now, let me just go back and we're gonna zero in on that time thing and I just wanna just show this to you. Here's a geologic time scale, millions of years, 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, now. So the last 35 million years. And remember, a lot of people have a hard time with big numbers like 35 million years. Those same people have no problem at all when I say 35 million dollars. <laughs> so don't worry about it, it's quite simple. Just, just a slight adjustment in your perspective and you're good to go. Now, it turns out that the people who study fossil mammals have really enjoyed working in this region because mammals evolve pretty rapidly over time. But not only do they evolve, they migrate. In North America, you have to think of North America as basically a room with three doors on it. One door leads to Asia, one door leads to South America, and one door leads to Scandinavia. And at various times in the past, one or more of those doors have been open, and animals and plants have migrated into North America from those various other continents. And Curiously enough, they've come into North America, but they only get preserved as fossils in areas that were subsiding and accumulating sediment and where that sediment is still preserved. So even though these animals may have come in from Russia into North America and been all over North America, it's only in Nebraska that they got preserved. So you're like the sample of the entire nation. And since mammals are always coming in from the different continents at various times, and because they're always evolving, as you go through time, the kinds of animals that you find change through time, both through the process of evolution and extinction and migration. And what mammal paleontologists do is they find a group of animals, and they find that that group of animals is found in different places at the same time, and they name that group of animals a land mammal stage, land mammal age. And those are the names over here, the Orellan, which you can't see below, there's one that says Shadronian. Shadronian, Orellan, Whitneyan, Arikarian, Hemingfordian, Barstovian, Clarendonian, Hemphilian, Blancan, Irvingtonian, Rancho Labran. Those are all different names for different kinds of assemblages of mammals. And what's phenomenal about Nebraska is you've got all these. You have this entire story. If you go to California, you might have like, well, we've got that one and that one and some of that one. 
But in Nebraska, you've got the entire stack. So you've got the complete story here, as we know it. It's the complete story as we know. And if you go to the museum, you can go to the Hempelian room or the Barstovian room, and there's a room full of fossils from that room. Uh, so it's quite cool. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of what these different faunas look like, because they're quite different than what's living here today, and they're quite different from each other. And the story of how this landscape changed and how the organism has changed and how the present landscape came into appearance is an incredible story. It also plays out on the stage of world climate change. So what's happening, and this is a diagram that shows you the last 70 million years, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, now. So Nebraska's story is good from 35 to now. And this is climate with warm on the right and cool to the left. So what you can see is the climate has been cooling kind of steadily for the last 60 million years. Here's the ice ages, here's now. And of course, we're warming the climate back up. And one thing you might ask is what happens in a warming climate? And I would tell you, if you want an example of what happens in a warming climate, go back to any one of the ancient Nebraskas you would choose because all these ancient Nebraskas were warmer than the present Nebraska. So the fossil record of Nebraska will tell you about potential future Nebraskas. It's a way to look back into the world and kind of flip it and think forward. So that's the context, the cooling climate. When you cool a climate, landscape changes, forests give way to grasslands. And in fact, that's what happened in Nebraska. When we start the story 35 million years ago, Nebraska was largely forested. If you go back to 50 million years ago, Nebraska was tropically forested. There were tropical animals. You run the slider all the way down here, part of Nebraska was covered by ice in the ice ages. So cold, warm, hot. And that's the context of change over the 35 million years. Now, this all starts with this guy, Edwin Barber, who was the director of this museum for 50 years. And the guy had a, a he lived during an amazingly interesting time. Imagine if you lived from 1856 to 1947. Imagine what you would have seen. You would have seen things like the Civil War and World War II in your life. And, you know, from the point of view of a conscious individual, he would have been nine years old in the Civil War. And he was an interesting aged person at the time of World War II. He saw things like the rise of automobiles and airplanes. But what he really saw were the fossils of Nebraska. And this guy was a, an amazing guy. And uh, the stories of him are, are replete. He had a vision for the paleontology of Nebraska, which I think holds, it rings true to this day which is there's amazing stuff out there, let's go get it and make an amazing museum that people from around the world will come see. Now, just across the state border in Colorado was his, I'm not gonna say nemesis, but let's just say, um, I, I spent 22 years at the, at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science in Colorado, and there was a barber-like character in Colorado. His name was Philip Reinheimer, and here he is, this rough-looking character on the right, he looks like Tony Soprano. This is Jesse Dade figure. No, 1864 to 1947, almost the exact same lifespan. This guy grew up in Alsace-Lorraine in, um, in France, and in the 1860s, his parents were seeing cyclical warfare in Europe, and they, were, they said seeing the uh, Franco-Prussian War, they predicted World War I, they're like, let's get the kids out of Dodge and move to the States. They immigrated to Pennsylvania. He became a steel worker at, in Pittsburgh, and then he got asthma because of the conditions in the steel mills. He moved to Colorado, got a job as a park policeman. He looks like a policeman, doesn't he? And then the museum hired him to be the guy who put coal in the coal-fired um, furnace. But he liked fossils. And he also knew how to bend steel. And so he made a deal with the director of the museum, that's Jesse Dade Figgins on the right, who had come to Denver from the American Museum in New York to um, become a paleontologist at the museum. And he started digging fossils in Colorado while Barbara was digging them in Nebraska. And they started trading fossils back and forth. And both museums grew as a result. And both museums have mounted skeletons were mounted by these guys during this time. And they were after this treasure trove of fossil skulls that could be plucked off the ground in the Western Plains. These, these ancient turned to stone skulls of extinct animals. And you have to be a paleontologist and a geologist and an anatomist to understand what's going on. You have to look at the skull and go, I can tell from the teeth this is a carnivore or an herbivore. I can tell from the teeth this is a dog or a cat. You basically understand the geology, the, the genealogy and the physiology of these animals. 
Um, you can, if you dig well, you can find whole skeletons. You can recognize a little fossil rodent with its rodent incisors, a little skeleton here. These are from what's called the Shadronian time, from about 37 to 34 million years ago. And you, in, in fact, this is a time when there were great volcanic eruptions happening over in Nevada, and the volcanic ash was drifting to the east and raining out of the sky. It would have been an awful time to be here, really, because instead of getting rain, you would get like more dust. It was sort of an airborne dust bowl kind of landscape. And the landscape here accumulated this dust, and often animals were, were killed and buried in the dust. And you find animals, like here's a group of animals that were buried in their burrow, and here they are reconstructed in their burrow, um, and preserved as beautiful little fossils. And there's some pretty crazy looking things. One that, um, a group of animals that's sort of vaguely related to pigs is a group called the Antelodonts. And one of the things I found while driving around with Ray Troll was that uh, my artist got obsessed with stuff. Like, I could point something out to him and he would get obsessed and he'd start drawing endless drawings of these things. So, um, and then of course, if you get one artist obsessed, you can get another artist obsessed. And this is Gary Staub, who's got some work in the museum. He's a, um, originally from Hastings, went to Hastings College, originally from Nebraska. And he's a, a paleo sculptor. So you can actually reconstruct the animals. So it makes it a lot more realistic just to look from the skull to the drawing to actually the 3D animal of one of these crazy knob-headed, pig-like, horrible things. And now here, here goes Ray. He's taken off. He's, now he puts the flames, um, you know, and he's, <laughs> did they, <laughs> I mean, you see where it's going, right? crime scene, um, or even this one. <laughs> so it, at times, I, I lose the um, gravitas of being a museum director um, just because it's fun having artists around. Um. <laughs> we do know that people learn when they're laughing. This is a well-proven fact. Here's a, a little saber-toothed cat-like animal called Hoplophonius. Again, beautiful skeletons that come out of the Shadronian. And here's what, maybe what this animal would have looked like in life. And uh, this guy, Lauren Isley, like, I mean, I, he's, this is taken over in the Capitol building, in that Hall of Fame. And I don't know what the, the sculptor thought about Lauren Isley, but it's a fairly brutal portrait of him. But, but he worked for the University of Nebraska as a fossil collector when he was a young man and wrote a famous poem called The Innocent Assassins, where he um, posited that these two Hoplophoniuses fought to the death. Now, the actual specimen that marks that is in the museum here. And if you look at it closely, I was told yesterday, much to my chagrin, that it looks like the animal looks like he's biting his own arm. <laughs> so I don't know what the real story is there. But it was made for a great poem by Lauren Isley. Uh, other animals that live in the shadow are these great big knob-headed animals called titanotheres or bronotheres. They're gigantic rhino-sized beasts. Um, they're related to rhinos, but they're not rhinos. And you can see them chasing a bunch of oridons around. Um, really um, classic denizens of deep time. And if you go to the Capitol building, I, I just walked over there just on a whim yesterday. I, uh, no one told me to go there. I just had a little hour. I walked in. And I was delighted and overjoyed to see the terrazzo floors in the Capitol building are, in fact, the geologic history of Nebraska. So embedded in your political structure is paleontology. There's no way out of it. You're trapped. But um, Edwin Barber worked with Hildreth Meyer to make these incredible things. And here is one of those bronotheres in tile on the floor of the Capitol. And it, you, if you have some time, just walk over. And you can walk through the entire story of history and life in the Capitol floor. Now, another person I want to bring up is a guy named Harold Cook. He's a Nebraskan. His, um, he was related to Captain James Cook of the, um, the, the British Navy, not of the Enterprise, the other James Cook. Um, and uh, here he is with the taper skull. And James, uh, Harold Cook was a, um, grew up on a ranch up by Agate Springs, Nebraska. His, and his father had nice ties with um, the uh, Sioux Indians at the time. And he grew into quite a scholar. And what's cool about Harold Cook was he's a Nebraska kid, but he ended up working for the Denver Museum for about three or four years in the late 20s. And he helped forge a relationship between Denver and Nebraska. And 
I just wrote a history of the paleontology of the Denver Museum, and it turned out that he personally wrote most of the scientific papers our museum published in the 20s and 30s. So we hold him in high, this high, we hold this in Nebraska in high esteem in Colorado, but he also fused relationships between these areas. And here, if you look at this picture, you can tell, see the ears, the noticeable ears? There they are. There he is. And there's Barber, Edwin Barber. On the Cook Ranch at Agate Springs, where there's now a national monument. Um, and the fossils from, from this site are the, a next step up the geologic chain. This is about 25 to 27 million years ago. It's called the Arikarean. And out on the um, Agate Springs Ranch, there's some amazing treasures in these rocks. You go out there, and if you go there now, you'll see these very weird things where these look like phone booths. Um, when I went there, I was like, what in the world is that thing? You get up close to it, it it's actually this weird corkscrew thing, right? And the people who first found these things were baffled, or what are these things called? And they named them Demon Elix, the Devil's Corkscrew. Just imagine the size of the bottle of wine, though, right? I mean, <laughs> and as they dug these things out, they found they're a little bit more complicated. They spiraled down and they came back up. And what they eventually realized, once they dug them out and exposed them, that these were infilled burrows of ancient rodents. So just think about prairie dog towns. If you had a three dimensional cast of the inside of a prairie dog town, and if you think about prairie dogs, they're going to dig straight down. You don't want a pipe that goes straight down because you just go in and fall. So this is sort of like the, um, the spiral ramp at the raised parking garages, right? Who knew? There it is, Demon Elix. And here's the, here's the culprit. It's the fossil beaver called Paleocaster. And the original one is what? Is in this museum. There's a cast of it at the Smithsonian. The real one is here. Cook found this amazing animal, uh, this incredible four-horned relative of the pronghorn antelope. And what we find again and again in the fossil record is you find stuff that's no longer alive, it's extinct, it's really weird, and if it weren't for paleontologists, we'd never know about it. At Agate Springs, they encountered this layer, a solid layer of rhinoceroses. It was like a gigantic lasagna pan full of rhinoceroses. And Carnegie Museum, and Amherst College, and the American Museum, and Denver, Nebraska, all came to that ranch. And they literally, basically, took slabs of lasagna home with them. They like, took, cut a square block. The Denver one's about eight by eight feet. The one in New York is bigger than ours, because they had a bigger spatula. I don't know what. But they take these blocks of rhinos home, and in museums around the country are these big slabs of Nebraska fossil rhinoceroses. Now our guy, um, Reinheimer, actually mounted his as a skeleton in a half mount, where half the mount was a fleshed out animal and half the skeleton. So you can see this interesting half mount kind of structure. Also at this site was this really, really weird animal. That if you look at the skeleton, you're like, what is it? It looks kind of like a cross between a horse and a giraffe. But notice it's got clawed feet. And I learned today that clawed feet are, are cleft. There's a weird split in the claws. Um, and they're these weird sloth-like, horse-like animals called calicotheres. Again, a kind of animal that you would never even make up. It's like a Mr. Ed on Gone Haywire. But what's happening is here, over time, these animals are migrating to North America from Russia across the Bering Land Bridge and into Nebraska, dying and getting buried in Nebraska. And here they are. Here's another one. I like this one, checking out the Moropus. Something about Ray thought like, something about a, a chubby teenager reminded Ray of a, a Moropus. <laughs> now, in this same bed is a truly terrible animal. It's an entelodont, but it's a big entelodont. It's a whopper, and here it is. This is Mary Dawson at the Carnegie Museum. This is the original specimen of Dinohyus. Um, which is a gigantic thing. This skull is almost as big as a Tyrannosaurus rex skull, but it's mounted on a bison-sized pig, and it lived here in Nebraska. And here's the one in, in the uh, Morrill Hall. You can see that this is the one, and this is a cast of the skull. The real skull is over in Nebraska Hall, and I was just looking at it, and it was like a religious experience to see this phenomenal fossil in, in real life. Um, and I love the... the the ad, 1931, porkers weighed two tons. 
So we went out and got some ourselves. And when I was at Denver, we built the life-size model of this beast and built a diorama around it. And this thing is phenomenal. In this space, when kids come around the corner and see this thing, it is terrifying. And we put a little speaker in its throat, so <laughs> it will occasionally just kind of go, wah, wah, wah. and kids jump like four feet. I remember when this kid walked in his eyes, he's like, he looked at it for a while and he goes, Jurassic pork. <laughs> we call it the Terminator pig. Um, so here we go. Here's Ray again. Two guys, one sticking to Dinahias. Or this one, temporarily astride the Dinahias, he smiled bravely. <laughs> and I like this one. The Dinahias about to bite the entelodon. So you can see the paleo artists um, make up what they will about these things. But all these are animals that you wouldn't even have known about had there not been a, a Nebraska fossil record. Now here's, here's North America three million years ago, and it's kind of different than it looks now. Three million years ago, it was a warmer world. There were no polar ice caps. As a result, sea level was higher, which means there was no Florida. As a result, there was no Bering Strait, which means there was a bridge into Russia. And so this open gate from Russia, which takes you into Asia, brings animals into North America. And shortly thereafter, the connection to South America was established as well. And for whatever reason, the animals coming in from here, or from here, or from there, ended up there, and are fossilized there. And my favorite are this very curious group of elephants, which arose first in Asia, and somewhere around 14 million years ago, the first elephants came across the Bering Land Bridge into North America, and we were invaded by elephants. We've been invaded by elephants several different times, but the first ones were very curious animals, called shovel tuskers. They had four tusks, two in the upper jaw, two in the lower jaw. In the lower jaw, the tusks were flattened out into sharpened blades. And you can see that they're the sharpened tusks. And so they have what's effectively a coal shovel. Now this one was from, from China. And you can see when the American Museum did its expedition to Mongolia, they brought back the jaw of one of these shovel tuskers. And you can see here the um, officials from the American Museum doing a um, a, a groundbreaking for a building using the lower jaw of a Chinese shovel tusk elephant. And you can see here is the shovel. So these really are aptly named. They do have tusks that look just like shovels, which begs the question, what were they doing? Because the, the tusks are, are blades, they're sharpened blades. So they're actually doing something. And there are many mysteries like this in paleontology where the anatomy of an animal tells me it was doing something but what was it doing? The answers remain to be seen. Here's one in the National Museum of China. Really long jaw, scooping blades, and two upper tusks. These guys ambled across Bering Land Bridge, and they wandered to Lincoln, Nebraska. They laid down and died. And this state has got a phenomenal record of fossil elephants from this time period. Barber knew this. He was out collecting lots and lots of them. Here's a lower jaw of one of these things, the longest lower jaw of any terrestrial animal here, that these elongate bladed tusks. Here's another one. There was wave after wave and evolution, and we had this great surge of elephants into the state of Nebraska. Now, I guess we're going to get some more elephants in Omaha pretty soon. And it's not a new thing. Your state is actually a Tusker state, not a Husker state, but <laughs> all these crazy weird ones, four perfect tusks, look at that, four round tusks. Um, here's a skull for that one. Here's a long-jawed elephant from Nebraska. I mean, there's just one after another of these dis extinct elephants that are little known. Even, you know, the, the collection that's on display here in Morrill Hall is the best public display of fossil elephants anywhere in the world. It's, there's not a better one in New York or London or Washington, D.C. It's in Lincoln, Nebraska. It's right here in this place. Um, here's Ray's image. Now, this, we're getting back to shovels and shovel tuskers. Out in Nebraska, land of the paleo elephants, facing down a herd of angry shovel tuskers with a shovel. Um, that's a repeated theme with Ray. And of course, I like this. Don't tell me it didn't happen in Nebraska. <laughs> Some cultural traditions die hard or have long roots. Um, one of the most amazing discoveries is one that is had about a 30-year history. It's the discovery of Ashfall State Historical Park. 
And this is this incredible site. And Mike Voorhees, who's been really devoted much of his career, he's a, he's a long time um, paleontologist at the museum here, and discovered this site and has worked with um, this museum to build the, the barn over the site and preserve what is arguably the best preserved fossil site that we know of. Now, I, didn't, I wouldn't have said that before I came because I didn't know, but I just spent uh, an hour in the Ashfall room today. And it is incredible. This is a site where animals were living on the plains of eastern Nebraska. Eruptions of volcanoes happened in Idaho. Ash rained down over a period of 60 days and basically choked to death and killed animals as they were sitting there. And there are incredible things. This is basically a Pompeii of fossil rhinoceroses and horses and birds and other animals. How many of the people in the room have been to Ashfall? Just show of hands. Look at that. That's awesome. That's like 70%. Uh, so one of our goals is to get uh, a crowd in New York to do that exact same number of hands, right? Because it, it is a remarkable place. I've never been, and I'm going to go later this summer with Nova to film there, and I'm delighted. I mean, but look at the quality of this thing. Here is a, a mother and child um, rhino preserved in the ash, in Ashfall. And this is a site that goes into the hill, and extensions of the barn will preserve more for future uh, folks. And, and we were talking about today with the paleontologists and the collections, they're trying to think of a better fossil site in the world for quality preservation. What you're seeing is Pompeii-like preservation, but Pompeii was only 2,000 years ago. This is 11 million years ago. It's an amazing, remarkable thing that something 11 million years old can be as preserved as well as something that was from the Roman, from Roman era. And it, what the insights we get are remarkable. You go into that, the room, they have all the skeletons from this place, and there's a whole level of resolution we had at no other fossil site. Incredible site. Of course, um, shortly thereafter, the, this little isthmus of Panama was connected, and we started getting animals coming in from South America. Things like giant ground sloths and armadillos and capybaras and, and other things. And stuff from North America went into South America. So that opened another door to North America, and more kinds of animals showed up in Nebraska and started getting fossilized in Nebraska. And then just after that, there was the beginning of the Ice Ages. And the Ice Ages were pretty aggressive. Here's what it looks like today. Here's what it looked like 18,000 years ago. Which is kind of amazing to imagine that much ice. And it came and went a bunch of times. Between 2.5 million years ago and 15,000 years ago, this ice came and went many, many times. And if you lived here, it would have not been good. You would not have been able to do much in the way of farming, or anything. Ecosystems were being buoyed up and down. Animals are being moved around the landscape. But eventually, after about 15 or 20 of these comings and goings, we end up with um, a Nebraska, where part of Nebraska, the eastern part of the state, was actually covered by ice. And I've actually been to ice sheets like this. This is a picture I took out of a helicopter up in the Canadian high Arctic. And there's a 300-foot high waterfall right there. So imagine that as the eastern part of Lincoln. And that's what it would have looked like in Lincoln, which is quite amazing. I'm from Seattle, where we use the Space Needle as a ruler. And 18,000 years ago, Seattle had, had five Space Needles of ice on top of it. It's quite amazing how thick it was. And, and, and it, that's what we're talking about, climate change. And the reality about climate change is we don't want it to get colder, and we don't want it to get hotter. It's been very nice for the last 10,000 years. Thank you very much. So we don't like climate change in the up direction or the around direction. We like it to be where it was. Where it has been for the last 10,000 years has allowed us to develop agriculture, and domestication of plants and animals, and fixed infrastructure on coastlines. It's allowed civilization to grow. So climate change in the up direction or the down direction is not desirable for humanity or for biodiversity. So we're trying to like, the goal for us is to keep the climate stable without crashing the economy. That's my thought on climate change. But when it was cold here, there's, <laughs> sorry, Lincoln. Um, so you have ice across the northern tier. And in this time, we have these incredible, yet another wave of elephants from Asia, the mammoths and mastodons. And you have this huge one in the hall here called Archie, um, installed in the hall. But while this one is being installed here, from the same town near Ainsworth, our guys in Denver were installing one of our very own in Denver. Nebraska was a net exporter of mammoths and mastodons. 
You think about what things you send out from the state as, as you know, your, what's your trade balance look like? You know, it's corn and mammoths and rhinos. <laughs> and you think that's not true, but if you go to the Smithsonian or the American Museum or museums in China and you see a, a mammoth, you go, where'd this mammoth come from? It's like, oh, it came from Nebraska. So this is a little known fact that you've been a supplier of these animals to, and, and here's Reinheimer and Jesse Dave Figgins. Um, you also have an amazing supply at this time of gigantic camels. Who knew? Really big camels, like twice the size of your standard modern Arabian camel. And this last Ice Age fauna has this mixture of mammoths and mastodons, sloths that came in from South America, gigantic, absurdly gigantic bison and deer, horses, camels. And in, uh, near Crawford in 1962, there was this amazing discovery of a mammoth, and they started excavating it, and like, were excavating it, and they realized, wait a minute, this thing has got too many tusks. And what they realized is that it was actually two mammoths, not one mammoth. And that specimen is now on display at Fort Robinson. And you can see the skull of one with one tusk, two tusk, three tusk, four tusk. Here's two male bull mammoths that got in a fight 15,000 years ago, got hooked onto each other, and eventually expired and were buried together. Um, here's this very uh, dramatic Mark Murkerson image of this fight of them going down. Now, one of the apocryphal tales about this um, thing is that when these things were found, they found a crushed coyote beneath them. So you can see, you can see Ray's drawing of the coyotes waiting. And you know, this whole idea of, um, if you hear read the early stories, that when they fell over and they crushed the coyotes, who knows it's not the case, but it might, in fact, be fossil evidence for Wiley Coyote, I think. It's possible. <laughs> it's possible. So I posit to you, if you think about Nebraska, formerly the corn husker state, I think that you should acknowledge the fact that you are, in fact, the shovel tusker state as well. 90 out of the 93 counties in Nebraska have supplied fossil elephants, the world fossil elephant supply. And it really is an important part of your heritage. So when you think about Morrill Hall and this museum, I hope you never think about it the same way again, because you have a world resource here. It's not just a Nebraska resource. It's in many ways how the world knows about what happened in mammal evolution between 35 million years ago and the present. And it's a, it's a big responsibility for you guys to take care of this huge underside of the iceberg. But you've got to do it, and the National Museum supports you, and I thank you for your time. Well, not only that was a very informative uh, presentation, Kirk, uh, but also very entertaining. Uh, Dr. Johnson has uh, agreed to answer questions. So uh, uh, the only rules are that uh, you have to go to the microphone. We are video streaming, and so everybody can hear the question. So please don't be shy. Come up to the microphone and uh, Introduce yourself and ask a question. Do we have, we have a microphone runner here too, don't we? Someone will move the microphone around, okay. Kurt, delighted to see you again. Last time I saw you was in Denver in, the, in your offices. Um, should I take it that uh, you're making a motion or a recommendation that Nebraska corn huskers be renamed the Tuskers? Now, let me just point out one little fact that I learned recently. The, the name corn huskers was settled on in 1893. Before then, there was a series of names in competition of what the team, the football team for University of Nebraska would be called. And one of the early names that was considered and dismissed was the man-killing mastodons. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Sarah. I'm a master's student in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences and working with curators at the University of Nebraska State Museum. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, so much for coming. That loved your talk. 
Um, I'm curious to know, how many years of road trips did it take to put together that fantastic map with your artist friend? Oh, yeah, so we traveled from uh, between 2000 and 2006, I think. It's like six years of, and it was like two week trips at a time. We do chunks of it. So we would drive and then write. And, and I would write a piece and then Ray would read what I'd written and draw me a picture. And I'd look at his picture and then draw, write him some words. So it was a long, overly long iterative process as this present book is taking us forever, but it's fun. <laughs> So if you had to hazard a guess, how, many total, how much total road time did it take to put that whole project together? Oh, driving time um, for the first book about um, two months, maybe, something like that. We, this, new, this second, the book we're working on right now, the West Coast book, we've traveled 190 days. So that's a half a year of travel. <laughs> and you can see Thanks it's, so much. It's, it's an awful task. <laughs> Thank you. A lot of, uh, of mammoth, mastodon, fossils have been found. How many thousands of years were they uh, inhabiting this area? We understand they disappeared maybe, what, 12,000 years, 15,000 years ago, but when did they first become established here? So this is, this is the, the question you don't really, you're not able to ask that question unless you actually find the fossil and date the fossil. So the, the shovel tuskers, those four tusk things, show up at about 14 million years ago. And they're gone five, around five million or something like that. The, um, the mammoths themselves come in a couple million years ago, like two, around two and a half million, and disappear at 2,000. The mastodons, um, I believe, a little bit more time. So, so for the question really is, in each one of these species, when did it arrive, when did it leave, or when did it evolve, and when did it go extinct? Those are sort of similar things. And the only way we can tell that is to find fossils and date those fossils. And, in Nebraska has got this tremendous record. You basically have 14 million years of elephant evolutionary history in this state. Hello, um, I was wondering what are the three counties that do not have? <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Sarpy, Bellevue, Sarpy County. I can I have a lifeline to one of my uh, paleontologists in the audience here? <laughs> I don't know the three, but does anyone in the um, August Assembled Paleontologist room know? George? What do you think? Arthur, Wayne, and Grant, thank you for the lifeline. Much appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> Arthur, Wayne, and Grant, I'm writing that down. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Nebraska. My name is Bob. I work at the state capitol. A footnote to the presentation uh, of the paleontological border, that chain of life that is in the rotunda, Irwin Barbour drew all of the images for those mosaic pieces. They were reinterpreted by Hildreth Meyer, but the originals, of which we have about 30 that are on canary tracing paper, are really superb pieces of art. Wow. Your friend Ray would have gotten along well with, with Dr. Barbour, um, and they were in color as well. And so all the artist Hilda Meir had to do was scale them down to fit within the border confines of what she was creating. Um, my question to you is, did you find the paleontological chain of life as Barbour had laid it out on the floor to be relatively accurate? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what, what, what um, is so interesting about the chain of life is that we didn't really know much about it in 1850, but between 1850 and 1890, the understanding of that geologic time scale came into pretty clear view um, through, through the work of, of paleontologists in North America and Europe primarily. And so the big picture, those elements of, that show up in the chain of life, they're, as, they're, they're perfectly legitimate. Now their postures have changed in some cases. You'll see sort of a more archaic pose to the dinosaurs, for instance. But the organisms are the right organisms in the right time frame. So it, it holds true. 
And uh, so are the original artwork in somewhere in the archives of the Capitol building? The, the, the 30, roughly 30 pieces that we have are in our archive, oh, absolutely. Good. One day I will come see you. Please do. <laughs> um, a, a, a comment as well, the pieces that were um, installed were um, created in, I'm trying to kind of picture the, the phrase, um, Hmm. Let me get back to you that. Okay. You're going to be at dinner this evening? I will be. I'll corner you then. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Can you have a lifeline if you want one? <laughs> so, Kirk, I have a question. So, since you really are very knowledgeable about uh, our collection, and, and, and you also made comments that, that maybe there's an opportunity to better... Uh, uh, inform the uh, public outside maybe Nebraska about our collections? Do you have any suggestions how we may better do that? So I think the um, what's interesting is is that you have an exhibit that was built uh, in the first half of the last century and we do know a lot more about how the world works. I'm giving a talk at the Geological Society of America tomorrow here and I'm talking about what we've learned in the geological sciences in the last hundred years and we, we as you know science has just surged forward in the last century. So there's a whole world of knowledge of, about the biology, geology, chemistry, physiology of these animals, the precise dating and ultimately we could tell the story really well now. You know, it was sort of like the rough draft was told the first 50 years. So, you know, it, it, my point is, is that this just isn't one of many small regional museums. This is a unique world treasure that has a really big story to tell. So my wish is that some way we tell that story really big here in Nebraska. And the, the big play is that r right now the museum is primarily uh, museum for the residents of Lincoln and the surrounding areas, as many regional museums are. The, the quality of the collections and the quality of the story merits a national and international audience. How that happens, I think it's going to take some bold leadership to do that, but I think it's an asset that, that Nebraska has, that no other place has, and it's a story that Nebraska has that no other place has. It's a story that's a relevant story for today, and I just love to see the story be told well and it, you realize that what that means is surfacing more of that iceberg. Right now, the tip of the iceberg is showing, let's float more of the iceberg. And it could be a very relevant thing. The two examples I, I gave, one is um, that they're both art museums, but two museums have sprung up in the last decade. One in the island state of Australia called Tasmania. It's an art museum that people are flying from Europe to see because it's, it's, it's been able to touch a nerve. And the other one is the Crystal Bridges Museum in Arkansas which is the Walmart family's art museum for the South. And again, basically these are museums that have been grown out of an idea and some visionary leadership and have basically catalyzed tourism to the region where the museum is. And so I think that there's sort of two plays of this museum. One is to um, continue to take care of it, but one is, is there a way, is there some way that the state or philanthropists could figure out to make this big story be told on a national stage for the benefit of the science, but also for, you know, it, this really is an asset that Nebraska has. Why not, why not show it with great vigor? Well, Dr. Johnson, uh, this really has been wonderful to have a great ambassador of our museum, and uh, certainly uh, we appreciate the leadership that you are showing at Smithsonian, and we're uh, proud that you are from this region and, and representing the, the country and, and the treasures uh, to the world. So please uh, join me again in thanking Dr. Johnson. <laughs> <laughs>